got a couple people on the call coming from North Dakota State University that's going to be presenting today. All right, so we've got some um, Kirsten who's going to be doing a lot of the presentation today. And so if you see her answering some things in the chat box every now and again, don't be surprised. Same with Mr. Sam Polin. And if you do have a question, please take time to answer, uh, put it in that chat box because we want to make sure that we try to answer any question that you might have. There's absolutely no such thing as a silly question. Most likely, if you have the question, somebody else will have it too. So we've got an agenda for you tonight, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to go over just some easy, sneezy, basic beef stuff for you. Then we're going to cover some safety because we all know that that's important. Um, going over several different safety aspects when it comes to grilling. Then we're going to spice it up with uh, Dr. Paul Berg. And then we're going to talk about the eating experience over the flavor profile. So that'll be a lot of fun. And I think you guys will find some things that are pretty interesting. All right, so we're going to start with some basic beef information, and I think uh, Mr. Sam Pullen is going to take us away. Yeah, that's right, so I'll do the uh, basic beef. So the first thing is we're doing barbecuing and grilling. That's the first topic we're going to talk about. So like with barbecuing, that's what you like with low heat. So have you ever had like pulled pork before with barbecue and pulled pork? That's like with their low heat that comes from like the brisket or the round. So that's going to be low heat. We're going to take it long and slow cooking. It's usually larger meats. So then like, like it said, pork butts or brisket. So you can, it's tougher meats from the locomotive. So like your upper back from your like arms or shoulders. So we slow cook it so we can keep all that moisture inside. While grilling, that's like your high heat. So that's with your like temperatures. That's your ribeyes, your steaks, all those ones that have a lot of flavor are from like your loin area. They're going to be cooked really quick and short because they're smaller meats like hamburger and veggies. And you're going to cook them small, um, quicker because they don't need as much heat, um, time to cook. So that's why you're going to have a higher heat. So if you go to the next slide, this is the primal of the beef. So this is what I was talking about. So we put the chuck and the ribs and the round. So when I said locomotive muscles, that's what like the brisket and chuck or the round and shake. The ones that the body parts are always moving. So like with the beef, they can get around, they can eat the grass, they can drink water. So all the parts of the moving while the rib and loin kind of area, that's like your position posture muscle. That's where your T-bones are gonna come from. So they aren't as moving as much. So that's why you don't need as high as low as heat. You need higher heat so you can render that fat down because they have a lot more fat. Um, Kirsten, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. So when I said tender muscles, this is like your T-bones, like I said before, or your ribeyes. Um, these are your cooking fast, so these are ones you're going to be grilling with low humidity. They, they benefit from that high temperature of cooking, like the, um, the PowerPoint says. Because um, for the muscle, they have a lot of muscle, and they have a lot of flavor in the fat with marbling. And you see a lot of cuts that you're going to use from the uh, tender side of the grill, like your strip, your T-bone, your ribeyes. Um, the next slide is more of your rougher cuts. So, like, these are for barbecuing. So, like, with um, pulled brisket or if you're, for pork, if you have pulled pork, this is where all that stuff is going to come from because this is the stuff that's keep moving. This is, like, the stuff that comes from the arms and the shoulders that keeps the animal moving. So they're always moving. They're getting tougher. They're getting smaller. They're getting more, um, less connective tissue and they can keep moving. So that's why, well, they're perfect for barbecuing. So that low temperature, you wrap them up, you give them some moisture and they keep that moisture in, makes them more tender, more soft, and they're really good to eat. Okay, next slide is we're talking about maturity. So do you guys know what, what, what we mean by maturity? Okay, so with maturity is like the older the animal and the young. So you see in the first picture, we have that four-year-old. It's a really dark color. And then on the other one, we have a 15 to 20-month-year-old. This one is the difference. So you see the younger is that brighter cherry color. And the older one has that darker red. But you also see the bones. And the older one, that bone is getting a little bit harder too. So that's why when you see the T-bone, if you like that, like you like 
that red and that um, red coloring that gets a lot of the flavor as well. And the next slide, we talk about marbling. So marbling is actually intramuscular fat that we eat. It's all those little white flecks you guys see on your steaks. That gives flavor to the steaks. So like with the T-bone and marbling, uh, T-bone and uh, ribeyes, you see all this seam, all these marbling, these intramuscular fat. Don't get that confused with that seam fat you see in the picture, that trim fat. Okay, that's the fat you guys don't really like to eat. This marbling is stuff you really like to eat because it adds more flavor, more juice to those steaks that you guys love to eat. And the next slide is talks about the quality. So there's there's multiple quality selection. So um, if someone wants to put in the chat, what you guys think is the probably the most common choice um, grade of beef you guys see or quality choice you guys see in the market or in the, you guys eat at home. I actually have a poll for that, so I can actually throw that up. And so I'm going to launch that right now. It should pop up on your screen. And so go ahead and do as Sam suggested and select which one you think is the most common grade of beef in the United States. So we're going to give them a couple minutes. If you want to continue kind of talking about this slide, you certainly can. So like what most people have on that thing of choice, that's more, that's more correct because that's what you're going to see in a lot of the re uh, restaurants and the grocery stores. That's what you see is that choice, USDA grade choice. Um, your prime is probably going to be more of the fine end, the high end, white tablecloth dining. And then the select, you don't really see as much at grocery stores because they aren't as valuable. But this is, goes off with marbling. Yep. <laughs> Some people make a joke of select that you grind it up to hamburger because it doesn't have that much flavor as the choice or the prime and all that's that the marbling carries. So this is why marbling is so important in grilling and barbecuing because that marbling gives you so much flavor. Um, in the next slide, I believe... Uh, we talk about protein with Leanne, I that is correct. So we're going to go over, you know, why on earth are we talking about meat right now? Because it actually plays a pretty important role in your diet. All right. So what on earth are proteins? Proteins are made up of amino acids. If you haven't ever heard that term, you will eventually in your schooling. And amino acids are the building blocks of protein, which is pretty neat. There's about 20 different amino acids in the body that we recognize, and nine of those are considered essential. And when I say essential, that means that your body cannot make it. So because of that, you have to be able to get those nine essential amino acids through your diet. That way, your body can utilize those because amino acids are very essential to your growth, uh, functioning of your body, such as hormones, energy production, immune function, just keeping you overall healthy, even nutrient absorption. And so maybe some of those that are a little bit older on this call has actually even identified the nine essential amino acids, which I have listed there. Certainly not important for today, but they certainly will be um, as you begin to grow in um, your schooling career. And the best part of it when we come to talking about proteins is the animal source of protein is one of the best, like beef, uh, to get your essential amino acids for your day. So when we think about what you need as an individual, I wanted to show you a little bit of a graph and then kind of go through, um, I know this is numbers, trust me, numbers can be boring. Maybe there's some people on this call that actually love working with numbers. So I wanted to know how much protein do I need in my daily diet? And so if you're sedentary, which means that you don't really, aren't really active, you um, maybe play video games or you're not a really heavy runner or doing soccer or any sort of sports, which is perfectly fine. They say that um, the recommended daily dietary allowance research has 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. 
And if you're more active or maybe you are going, you're, you've been, um, had an illness of some sort and you're recovering or you're stressed out a lot, usually you need a higher amount of protein in your diet to get your daily allowance. And so then they jump up to about 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram of body weight. So I know this is a lot to take in, but bear with me. So for example, I'm taking me. Um, for example, I'm pretty active. I ride horses. I love to mountain bike. I do a lot of triathlons and I love to run. So I am really active. So I have to go up into the higher range, the active part of things. And so I would take my body weight. So I weigh 110 pounds and I need to convert that to kilograms. So I divide that by 2.2 to get the 50 kilograms of body weight there. And then I take that 50 grams of body weight and I multiply it by how much kilograms that I think I need um, that is a more on the active side of protein, which results for me, I need about 75 grams of protein per day. So if we look at the graph on the right, when I go to my age, so down towards the bottom, I'm 35, and it says women in the second to the bottom um, graph, women ages 19 to 70 plus, it says 46 grams. So I actually need way more than the recommended daily allowance. For you that are on this call, you might fall under either girls from 14 to 18 or boys from 14 to 18, or maybe you're even a little younger. And so you can kind of see the different amount of grams that might be needed in your diet, given whether you're super active or not, you might need a little bit more than what's actually stated there. If you're in a lot of sports, if you're running around, maybe you're on a farm and you're out day, outside working all in hay and helping with your mom and dad that's still considered being pretty active. So when we think about meat consumption, what on earth does that look like? Um, so consuming five to seven ounces of meat daily, we can kind of identify that with a visual representation. So we say four ounces of serving cooks down to three ounces. And we say start with four because you're gonna lose some of that fat and water to evaporation. And so if you start with four ounces, that's going to give you about that three ounces of daily recommendation. And that kind of looks like what's in the palm of your hands. Or if Kirsten, if you'll do one more click for me, it kind of looks like a deck of cards. So if, for two different types of visuals, if you want to see what the actual amount looks like, that you're going to need to cook up to eat what you're going to kind of see. And so meat is such a great source of so many wonderful things beyond just the amino acids. We've got iron, magnesium, zinc, niacin, selenium, riboflavin, B vitamins. It's a lot of fun to kind of identify some of these things and why it's so important to eat meat. Okay, everyone. Now we are going to be talking about safety. And the topics that we're going to be talking about there's going to be knife safety, food safety, and grilling safety. So with knife safety, the sub-segments that we're going to be talking about is the common household knives, different knife sharpening techniques, the correct hand placement when cutting, and then walking with a knife, and what to do when a knife falls to the ground. So the first common household knife is a chef's knife. This is typically a multi-purpose knife, meaning that you can use it for mincing, chopping, and slicing a variety of different vegetables and fruits. The second knife is a serrated knife. This is similar to a saw because it, is, it can easily cut through hard exterior and soft interior food items, for example, like freshly baked bread and avocados. The third knife is a steak knife. This is commonly used for various cuts of meat, but it's also found to be a good utility knife for small amounts of vegetables and fruits. So like you can cube cheese or you can slice cherry tomatoes. Our fifth and final knife is a butter knife. This is mainly used to spread various amounts of different spreads like butter, peanut butter, cream cheese. I do not recommend using this to cut beef. So remember to keep your knife sharp. A dull knife is a common reason people will become injured. So the, one of the ways to remember this is a safe knife is a sharp knife. So different techniques when sharpening a knife is the first one is a tri-stone sharpener. 
And the reason it's called a tri-stone is because it utilizes three different types of stones, fine, medium, and coarse. You'll use the certain stone depending on the dullness of your blade. And it also is highly recommended to use some form of oil or water prior for sharpening because the oil or water prevents the stone from clogging with waste material and helps maintain a smooth movement when using the blade across the stone. And when we mean by waste material, it's not like waste material. It's typically just um, material off of the knife. Now we're going to play a video kind of demonstrating how to use a tri-stone sharpener. So as you can see, he's using a 22.5 degree angle. And the way to achieve this is you can start with a 90 degree angle, cut it in half to a 45 degree angle, and then cut it in half again to get that true 22 and a half degree angle. As he's running the blade across the stone, you wanna make sure that you're applying firm pressure when gliding the blade across the stone. You don't want the pressure to be so strong that you're causing a bend in the knife because you can potentially break the blade but also you want enough pressure that you have full control of the blade as it is being moved across the stone. A second option is a manual sharpener. So this sharpener will have two settings, coarse and fine. And these will be labeled on the sharpener so that it minimizes any confusion. So coarse setting is used to sharpen the blade's edge, where the fine setting is used for everyday maintenance. And then again, we'll have a video how to demonstrate to using a manual sharpener. So the coarse setting, it's typically used for mildly dull blades or severely dull blades. This is gonna help fix your blade's edge where the fine setting is just like, again, the everyday maintenance to keep the blade efficiently sharp that you're easily able to cut through a variety of different of food products like vegetables, fruits, and even meat. And then finally, another technique is using a steel. However, please remember that steels do not sharpen your blade. What a steel is used for is to remove nicks or what we call chips or barbs on your knife. And then to also push out of line edges back into place. So give you that nice, smooth, in sync edge. And then when I play this video, you wanna make sure that you go slow because it provide, or allows you to get a better, cleaner edge and then the ability to move as most chips or nicks as possible. Also, as the video is being played, see how he's moving the blade away from him? This is a safety. And what happens is like, if for some reason you're using the steel and something slips, the blade will go away from you versus if it slips when you're moving it toward, you could potentially injure yourself. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about correct hand placement when cutting. Can anybody tell me which picture demonstrates the correct hand placement? I can put it in the chat box. It's either the picture that on too. the left or the picture on the right. So if you think it's on the left is the correct one, put left. If you think right one on the right, All right, good job, guys. So if you said on the left, you are correct. And then we're going to watch a video and explain like why this is important for having that hand placement. So when using the correct hand placement, what we're talking about is you see how the hand is, knuckles are protruding a, like a, out then versus your fingertips. This is, a safe way to do this because you can use your knuckles as a guide for the blade when cutting. And it also allows you not to nick yourself or cut yourself when cutting versus if you have the fingertips out, you increase your chance of actually cutting your fingertips. And then also the correct placement allows you to have a firm grip on the vegetables and or fruit so that you don't send the vegetable or fruit flying across the kitchen. I have done that before. And Kirsten, what? knife were you using in that particular video? 
So I believe in this video, we were using the serrated knife. So again, like you can use a serrated knife um, for a tomato because the tomato kind of has that hard protective skin around it and, and it's very soft in the inside. So you are able to use that serrated knife to get a clean slice cut. So which video or do you guys think is going to be the correct way to walk with a knife? I'll play the videos first and then we'll see what you guys' decisions are. So watch the video and then put your answer into the chat box. So this is the one on the left. Carry in the knife. And if I need to replay the videos, please let me know and I will have no problem. And here's the one on the right. So we'll play it one more time on the left. And one more time on the right. All right, you guys did a great job answering. Oh, well, some of <laughs> some of you put right. <laughs> it's all right. So you said the video on the left, you are correct. But why, why is this important? So when walking, you want the blade facing downwards toward your feet. And then the edge of the blade, you want it facing backwards from you. And this avoids risk of injury to you or someone else. And then with the way the blade is facing downward, it also, like if for some reason you trip or something, it prevents you from cutting yourself or even stabbing yourself. So please remember not to walk with a knife this way. <laughs> and so you can kind of see in that video how the knife is pointing right at the videographer and that would be very unsafe if you were to trip. All right, so now we have another set of videos for when a knife is falling. I will play the videos and then we'll ask you guys to determine which is the correct one. And I'll play each video twice. All right, so put in the chat box. Looks like you guys are doing a great job. Which one is correct? Nice work, guys. All right, tell us why. All right, so if you said the video on the left, you are correct. So why you should never catch a falling knife. So trying to catch a falling knife can actually lead to injury. The safest thing to do if a knife falls is to just let it fall on the ground. And then you can easily safely pick up the knife, wash it with hot water and soap, dry it off, and then continue to reuse it. A way to prevent a knife from falling is to keep the knife in a safe location. And when we mean by safe location, we're talking about keeping the knife at the center of your cutting station and away from the edge of the table. So now we're going to move on to our second topic of safety and that is food safety and in this we'll talk about thermometer calibration cross contamination and internal temperature so let me play the video of how to calibrate your thermometer so when calibrating your thermometer you want to place the thermometer in a cup of cold water with crushed ice after seeing the initial temperature reading you can adjust the the temperature, or not the temperature itself, but like you can adjust the dial with the knobs on the underside of the thermometer to show the ideal temperature. And in this case, the ideal temperature is going to be 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So as you can see in a close-up of the thermometer calibration, it is important to remember to routinely calibrate your thermometer because this is going to be what's going to tell you or indicate to you the temperature of your product as you're grilling or cooking, which is very important. So who knows what is cross-contamination? And you guys are more than welcome to shout it out or even put it in the chat box. Okay, so cross-contamination 
is the mixing of different foodborne pathogens or germs from meat and or vegetables and fruit. At the end of the day, foodborne pathogens can be identified as germs. So what we mean by germs is like bacteria, virus, or parasite that can cause a food-related illness, like E. coli 0157H7, which is a bacteria, salmonella, which is a bacteria, norovirus, which is a virus, and then Listeria monocytogenes, which is also another bacteria. And predominantly the bacteria are come from undercooked food. And this is why we're going to emphasize the importance of internal temperature later on. And then norovirus is from improper hand washing techniques. So again, washing hands is extremely important. So in this video, we're gonna demonstrate how to not cross contaminate. And one of the easiest ways to not cross contaminate is to always make sure that you wash your hands at least for 20 seconds and you can you know when 20 seconds is done by counting your abcs additionally ideally we would like to use two different cutting boards and different knives one set for vegetables and fruit and one set for meat however if you don't have two different sets of cutting boards and knives you can easily clean the cutting board and knife before switching from meat to vegetables and fruits. And this can be easily done with, again, hot water and soap and a clean paper towel or kitchen towel. And then at the end, it's like to remember, cook food to safe temperatures as well, because that will at the that is the last step to minimize cross contamination. So to, to not cross contaminate is to use a clean plate for your cooked entree. So as you can see at the top, it's going from raw to partially raw and then to all the way to cook. You don't ever want to take a cooked product and place it on a plate that has been used for raw products. So who can tell me what is internal temperature? So internal temperature is found in the inside middle of a meat product. So reaching the ideal internal temperature is very important because it ensures that your food is safe to consume. So safe cooking temperatures, um, we have developed a chart for everyone. So beef steaks, pork chops, and even lamb chops the safe temperature is 145 degrees Fahrenheit, where ground beef, ground pork, and ground lamb, is, the safe temperature is gonna be 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And then poultry is gonna be 160 degrees Fahrenheit for like a chicken breast, where ground chicken is gonna be 165 degrees Fahrenheit. When taking the internal temperature, you wanna make sure that you're using a food safe thermometer and not a medical thermometer. And we have provided some pictures of common food safe thermometers. They can be on the left is a digital thermometer where on the right is a common linear thermometer. So in this video, we're going to demonstrate how to correctly determine the internal temperature. So as he's picking up this beef steak, you want to make sure to insert the thermometer in the side of the meat product, or in this case, the steak. And then you want to make sure that you're essentially getting to the middle of the steak. Now, in a ground beef patty, you're not going to have to stick the thermometer in all the way in as you would as a steak, mainly because of the size differences. The reason we want to go to the middle of the beef steak or even the ground beef patty is because that's where we're going to ensure the most accurate temperature reading. And then here we'll demonstrate how to do this for a burger. And then if for some reason that your thermometer is upside down or anything, you can easily turn the thermometer without having to take it out and reinsert it. So what do you do with any leftover food? 
So typically what we would like to do is to place leftover food in the refrigerator in the refrigerator after cooking. The refrigeration temperature ideally needs to be at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And kind of like this golden rule is if it's hot outside, like it's above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you want that leftover food in the refrigerator in less than an hour. And then if it's outside and it's a below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you want that food to be in a refrigerator in less than two hours. And then when placing the food in the refrigerator, you want to make sure that you use an airtight container because it's going to prevent your food from spoiling quicker. All right. So what temperature should you preheat your grill to prior to placing any type of food items on the grill? There's no wrong so answer. There's a little cheat sheet too. Yeah. All right. So we got some good guesses in there. 400, 450, 425. Good job, guys. And those are all wonderful answers. Because you want to heat your grill to at least 400 degrees Fahrenheit before grilling because this will kill any potential foodborne pathogen or even germ on the grill rack, which is at the end of the day essential to having a safe product. So finally, our third and final topic is going to be grill safety, where we're going to be talking about the cleaning of the grill, safely attaching a propane tank, starting the grill, and then how to control the flames. So in these videos, we're gonna be showing you guys how to correctly do cleaning. Um, the cleaning from the left video is mainly to be done annually or, or once a year, where versus the video on the right, this is daily maintenance or every time you use the grill, this is the type of cleaning that you wanna do before you heat up the grill and place product on it. So in the video on the left, what he's doing is he's taking the grill grates out, out of the grill, and then he's gonna be taking what we call the flame guards. And what he'll be doing is he's using a grill brush, and grill brushes typically have like these bristles attached to it, and then also the metal scraper um, a, on top of that bristle. And you can use either side in here. He's using the metal scraper to kind of scrape off any remaining grease or food particles that were left behind. And Kirsten, why would it even be important to scrape that stuff off? So it's important because there's a common myth with grills that they're similar to cast irons. Where cast irons, they capture that flavor and, and you want to like reuse it. It adds flavor to additional products. Where with grills, you don't necessarily want that to be left on because it can affect the flame and then also add unsafe food particles to your product that you're trying to cook. So as you can see, he's actually getting inside the grill and scraping down um, on the sides of it. So do not be afraid to get elbows deep into this grill or any grills that you guys have at home. This is actually really good maintenance care for your grills. It prolongs the life as well. And then there's also a drip pan that he had pulled out that he's also scraping off. And like As you guys can see, it's doesn't take much effort in getting the stuff removed. It just can be a little time consuming depending on your grill. And then I will go ahead and start the second video on the right. So this is again what he, you want to use on like on daily maintenance or any time that you guys start up the grill just to take the bristles on the grill brush and just go over your grill grates. Make sure that the actual surface that's going to be touching your product is clean. And then if you don't have access to a grill brush, another trick that you can use is ball up aluminum foil, and this can just as effectively clean and remove particles as a grill brush. So when attaching a propane tank, one of the things to look at as we watch this video is 
there's a female end of the hose that's going to be attached to the male end of the propane tank spigot. And you want to remember kind of like a golden rule is righty tidy, lefty loosey. Also, so you have thread marks with the hose end and then the propane tank end. This should be a simple, like be able to screw on. If you have to force it, don't. Um, because this could potentially ruin your, your thread marks and that could result in a very small leak with the tank. Um, and again, at the end of the day, you want a tight seal to avoid any prone pain um, gas from leaking out as this can eventually be very dangerous. And don't be afraid to ask your parents to kind of show you how to do this the first or second time. You know, parental supervision is good until you feel safe and comfortable doing something like this. All right, so now we're going to demonstrate how to start the grill. Before we play this video, we want to remind everyone to keep your grill in a safe location. So you don't want to have your grill being used in a garage or right up against the wall or in an area with a low bearing ceiling um, as this could potentially be a safety hazard in regards to fire. So as he's starting up the grill, you can see how he pushes the knobs inward and then begins to turn them to the desired heat setting. And again, this is also something that you're gonna want parental supervision until you become comfortable and well acquainted with how to start up your grill. And then again, just a reiteration in this video, you close the lid to like preheat your grill to that desired at least 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And typically at this point, you could start seeing um, some of the heat waves or smoke come out and that's perfectly fine. That is kind of an indication, a physical indication of like when it's ready or preheated for your steak. So how to control the flame. So when starting the grill, the Flame knobs do not need to be maxed out or on the lowest setting. You want the flames hot enough to heat up the grill racks, and typically this is around medium to high. So again, like make sure to close the lid after you started up the grill and you have a good flame going so that you can heat up everything faster and it's more controlled. Where And if the flame ever becomes out of control or you become hesitant with it, you can close the lid, turn the flame or turn the knobs off, and then turn off the propane tank. And then you can always restart and try again. Um, so again, there's definitely simple methods in, to get comfortable with operating the flame. So other types of grills that um, are common in households are you have a gas grill or which is what we've been using the propane tank as you can see at the bottom. So some of the disadvantages though are flavor and price. So you're not going to get that traditional smoky flavor and then you're going to have the um, and it's also more expensive than charcoal grill. So next is like our charcoal grill. So this is going to use charcoal instead of gas for fuel and firepower. You're going to get great flavor and taste from it with that smokiness. However, some of the, the disadvantages are the time and price. So it does take some time to preheat your grill to the desired 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you have the additional expense of purchasing the charcoal. Another option is a wood fire grill or commonly known as a pellet grill. So as you can see in the picture on the left hand side is where your pellets are going to go and that's going to show you how this grill operates with the pellets and develops that unique smoky flavor. With the pellets you can use a variety of different um, pellets like you have hickory, mesquite, cherry, and etc. And this is going to be used traditionally for grilling and barbecuing. However, some of the disadvantages are the overpowering flavor from the pellets, and then depending on the quality of pellets can also be expensive. 
Then there's an electric grill. So as is said in the name, this is powered by electricity. However, this is great for indoor and outdoor use. However, the disadvantages are is that you're giving up that smoky flavor. And then there's the portable grill. So this can be either propane or charcoal, easily transported to, you can take this to camping, tailgating, you name it. However, the disadvantage is a small in size. So you may be able to grill for two to four people, but you're not going to be able to do for 10 people like you would at some of the other grills. So with that, we're going to move on to spice, and that is where Paul Berg will be introducing you guys and giving you guys a run through of the spice segment. All right, could I have the first slide, please? Spicing it up, obviously, if you've heard the expression spice up your life, this is where it comes from. We usually put something on meat to enhance the flavor. Most of us wouldn't like a beef steak if it didn't have some kind of a flavor additive put to it. And I always ask the question, what's the first thing you're going to put on a chunk of meat before you throw it on the grill? Anybody got any ideas? I hope all of you said salt. But salt is not really a spice, it's just a chemical. It's just sodium chloride. Spices, on the other hand, are things that come from like bark or seeds, uh, roots in occasions, some nuts occasionally. They all produce different kinds of flavors. And you know, we also use herbs and they tend to be leafy products. And herbs probably should be used only in a marinade because if you put a leafy product on a chunk of meat and throw it on a grill, you're gonna have a little bit of a char left over from the from the herb and it doesn't do you much good for enhancing flavors so, so we want to enhance flavors and there's some chemical uh, things that go on when you when you do this kinds of things so there's no particular scientific method of deciding when you have enough of your your spices and rubs on a steak it's it's your own personal preference and the key issue to making a good rub or a good marinade is the proportion of the products that go into it. And we'll talk a little bit in the future, I think, about you know, making some ethnic choices. So if you want something to taste like a taco, you put the proper steaks on. So and you're going to learn over time just exactly how much of stuff you ought to use. Our basic recipe that we use uh, in our, what we have a, a little car, uh, catering group at North Dakota State University, it's the ad, uh, graduate students, and they have the carnivore catering basic rub. You're going to see me here where I'm weighing products out, and that's the safest way to do it because if you get you know, regular table salt, it's going to weigh more than if you use kosher salt, and that's going to weigh more than if you use sea salt. So if you use a scale, you're going to come out with the same proportions all the time because you do it according to weight. But most of us don't have a scale, so almost all the recipes you're going to see are based on volumes. And our basic carnivore catering mix is 10 parts of salt. And if we were to mix up a 100 grams sample, 100 grams of salt is about a third of a cup. It's a pretty generous third of a cup. And we use a tenth of a, of a part of, by a weight of coarse ground black pepper. And that's generally a heaping teaspoonful is gonna get you pretty close to the, the 10 grams to get your one part of, of pepper. And then, the last portion is, we use granulated garlic. I think you get a bolder uh, garlic flavor from granulated than you do from, from the powder, but uh, either one will work. And that we put in there by weight about four tenths of a part. So you know, that's about three quarters of a tablespoon of granulated garlic. Put them all together in a bowl, 
and you need to whip them. If you shake them, the pepper comes to the top and you don't get a very good mix. So you rotate it with a spoon or something like that and it gets mixed up pretty good and then you're ready to go. We have a next slide that so if you're going to put a, say, our granulated mix on a steak, first of all, you probably need to remove the excess moisture by ta tapping it out with a, a paper towel. Make sure you have a clean paper towel. And all you do is grab a fistful of that stuff and get your hand about 18 inches over the top of the steak and sprinkle some stuff on the salt. On the, on the surface of the meat. If you don't like the distribution on there, you rub it. That's where the product gets its name as a rub. But usually if you're, you're 18 inches or so over the top of the steak, you're going to get a nice distribution. So you pick up the steak and you shake it a little bit, the stuff excess falls off. And if you do that correctly on both sides, you should have a properly seasoned steak. I think one of the reasons why most people like restaurant product steaks as opposed to home cooked steaks is because the guys that do it in a restaurant do this many, many times a day and they're pretty good at it. They get the right amount of seasoning on there so you don't get too much or too little. It, as a rule, you can find a bad restaurant, I guess. You got the next slide out, please. So marinades, you can really, you can make a marinade out of any of any kind of a, of a rub. All you have to do is add some kind of liquid, uh, anything from water to oils to soda pop to booze. You guys shouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> it makes it a liquid and you, you make your marinade. It's, Got the liquid in it. If you're using just plain water, we'd probably call it a brine. If you're using uh, a fruit juice, a citric acid, you're gonna also enhance the tenderness a little bit because there's an acid in citrus flavors or in citrus juices that are gonna start to loosen up the proteins a little bit. Uh, if you use, uh, say, milk, there's another, or milk or any of the dairy products, yogurt, that kind of thing, it's a different kind of tenderization product, but it does add flavor. It does add to the tenderness, tenderizing the product. Then the last thing we could use is tropical fruit. And they're very harsh on their attacking protein. And they actually degrade the protein to the point you change your mouth feel. Remember, a marinade is for a marinade. It's not to, it's not to be used as a dipping sauce unless you reserve some product so you don't put it on the meat and then scrape it off and use it as a as a dipping sauce you make sure you have some reserve that hasn't been on the on the, the meat product itself the components of this teriyaki marinade you'll see there's a fourth of a cup of pineapple juice in there uh, you put some soy sauce in those two things kind of make it an oriental Teriyaki is obviously an oriental name, so uh, makes it an oriental product. You would find at a Chinese restaurant or a Japanese restaurant, one of those. Put some honey in there to kind of mitigate a little bit of the spices. Uh, it's a very harsh marinade. You don't want to leave it the product in that very long because pineapple is a tropical fruit. It's got an enzyme in it that breaks down protein very rapidly, and you can really change the, the mouthfeel. You know, it'll get to the point where it's meat-flavored marshmallow or something like that. That's not good. So, All right, we got another slide yet? Brine is nothing more than basically water and salt, and brine should be used or best used on products that are extremely lean, like a turkey breast or a chicken breast or a pork product that all the external fat has been removed. Depending on what you put in them, if you use something more than salt, you're going to have an enhancement of flavor. They do something for the tenderness of the meat, but mostly they protect 
there's a process called osmosis where the lean meat picks up flavor in the or water in the individual cells so they start with a higher moisture content when you put them on the grill and your product ends up much juicier when you get, get through cooking it and you know flavor vinegar is a tenderizing product that's got a very mild it's called acetic acid and you can put other stuff in there a lot of brines have whole peppercorns for instance some of them have rose hips and a few other things to uh, try and change the flavor profile of what you're cooking a little bit uh, you see brines used a lot on game meats primarily because they are very lean to start with but you know, some people think they don't like the wild flavor, so that's why they use the stuff that goes in them. A brine probably is, <clears throat> you're going to put a product in there a minimum of two hours uh, in a refrigerator, maybe as much as two days. Uh, if you don't have a whole lot of, put vinegar or some other thing that's going to attack the protein um, overnight is probably the longest you're going to want to use it. Got another slide. Good. All right. Thank you, Paul Berg, for that. Now we're going to be moving on to the eating experience, which is our final topic for this evening. And in this, we're going to be watching a segment from Dr. Eric Berg as he talks about taste and flavor profile. And the key takeaway from this is that taste is the science and flavor is the art. Hey everybody, I'm Eric Berg, meat scientist with Barbecue Boot Camp. Today we're going to talk about the difference between flavor and taste. Okay, so you've learned or you've come into this with, with uh, experience about spices, marinades, and rubs. And the combinations that go into those spice mixes, the combinations of things and uh, the chemistry that goes into those marinades, it all comes back to flavor and taste. And now you might have heard those used pretty synonymously. So if something has great flavor, something tastes good. Well, there is, being the science nerd, there is a difference between those two things. In fact, I like to think of flavor as the art of barbecue, the art of outdoor cookery, the art of meat science, whereas taste is basically the science. Okay? So let's start with the science. Um, if you've taken a uh, consumer family science class, you've probably determined or you've probably learned what the four tastes are. There's actually five, but there's four that everybody pretty much remembers. So, the first one that most people say when I have a group here and I say, well, what is, what do we have taste buds for? We don't have flavor buds, we have taste buds. And most everybody says sweet. Comes to mind first. Everybody's got a sweet tooth. Next, most people think of the other S, salty. There are actually three S's in here. We have taste buds for sour, okay? And then sour's close cousin right behind that is bitter. So we've got sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. We have distinct taste buds that pick those up. And those taste buds have developed over millions of years to pick these up, to help keep us safe, and also for us to identify good nutritious food. Now there's a fifth one that's the newest, and it's got kind of a funny name. Um, it's fun to say. Many of you Food Channel people probably know umami. Umami is for the Japanese for delicious, or as in, umami that tastes good, okay? It has to do with the deliciousness. And when we uh, start talking about putting together rubs and spice mixes, we want to balance these out for the type of meat we're gonna put it on, for the type of food item we're gonna put it on, and there's a kit that's going to come with this that does a little experiment where you can make a broth to give you a taste of umami. And then you can notice we will oftentimes will salt our steaks and that brings out the umami. Now the science behind umami is it's that aging flavor. When we age beef or we age a steak, there are certain amino acids, there's little tiny building blocks 
blocks of proteins that turn into a salt, and that's a salt of glutamate. Maybe you've heard of um, monosodium glutamate as a synthetic form of that. So aged cheese, aged meat, ripe tomatoes. Think about something that you use the most common condiment that we put on our hamburgers that help enhance the umami. It's ketchup. We put ketchup on a hamburger, not a steak, but that's a story for another time. So this is the science. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami. Let's talk about the art. How do we take this science with the taste buds we have to determine deliciousness and put it all together? I have an abbreviation for the art. T. M. A. X. T to the max. So we've talked about the T. That's the science. That's all these taste buds that we have over here. But M, what's M? This is the art. So M has to do with the palatability. And that, we'll call that mouthfeel. So have you ever gotten a tough steak? And just that tough steak, because you had to work so hard at it, it affected the overall flavor. If you've ever had a low-fat hot dog and you start chewing on that, the mouthfeel of it is very sproiny. That's a in science technical term, sproiny. It's like chewing on a rubber hose. That's why people buy them once. But there, there's that specific mouthfeel and it turns people off. It affects the flavor, even though it's just a physical characteristic. It's a mental thing. A, okay, if you have kids and if they have something they don't like to eat, how do you get them to eat it? What do they do? They plug their nose. They plug their nose because they take this factor out. Aroma. Also by plugging the nose, it takes away that olfactory nature and they'll eat that broccoli, they'll eat that Brussels sprout. Okay? But they gotta plug their nose to do it. Aroma has a huge impact on the flavor. Think about uh, when you walk into a restaurant and you smell the great food smell. That kickstarts your whole digestive system in anticipation and it primes what you're going to perceive as the flavor. When you walk into a barbecue and you smell that great smoky flavor, that aroma kickstarts the flavor. So what's X? X. X rolls everything together. X is the unknown. X is the X factor. Well, shoot, Eric, what do you mean by that? Think about this. X is also the experience. When you walk into that restaurant and it's got, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the ambiance of the restaurant to give you a great experience because you're going to associate that ambiance with the delicious food you just ate. It's the grandma effect. When you go to grandma's on Thanksgiving Day and you walk into the house and you smell that turkey, oh my gosh, grandma always made the best turkey. And you have all these memories associated with that great turkey and it affects your perception of the flavor. But there's also the opposite that can happen. What if grandma was a horrible cook and you walk in and you smell that distinct smell of turkey and you know that you're going to have to load up on gravy because it's dry, it's tasteless, it's blah. That experience impacted your perfect perspective, your perspective, your, how you were going to interpret that overall flavor. So here, flavor is the art, taste, taste buds are the science. Thanks for your attention today. Okay, so after watching the taste and flavor profile, we're going to move on to the rusting your meat. And the reason this is important is so when you don't want to remove the meat from the grill or you want to remove the meat from the grill to a clean dish because you don't want the meat product to continuously sitting on that heat source and, and cooking. Um, you want to allow the meat to rest for a minimum of five minutes. And by rest, we mean just to leave it alone. You don't want to cut into your meat right away because it's like this by resting it allows to keep the juicy as you can see in the photos like the photo on the left exhibits like as soon as you take the steak off of the grill and you cut right into it you're losing all that juiciness which is a lot of flavor and 
where the photo on the right is after allowing it to rest for at least five minutes and then cutting out, you're gonna get that better eating experience. So with that, we're gonna leave you guys with, if by following these guidelines, you're gonna get an awesome burger as demonstrated in the video. And a fun little saying that goes along with grilling is if you're looking, you're not cooking. So making sure that you're not popping that lid open every two seconds um, and making sure that that uh, grill allows it to heat and do its thing without checking on it every second. I know it's tempting to flip the burger every minute, but uh, that's not a good way to keep your juices there and, and cook it um, to perfect. One, what platform do we enter the video on? Oh, I will get to that here in two seconds. Thank you so much for asking that. I'm so excited that some of you guys are going to be doing the grilling contest. So a little bit more on the grilling contest and feel free to, if you're kind of thinking up a question to ask us, uh, this will give you some time. Um, what we are going to do uh, we want to see your creativity. I want to see what you guys are going to cook up for us. So, and we are really excited and spread the news. If you know of a friend that hasn't seen this and would potentially be interested in grilling, tell them about this. This will be such a fun opportunity. And so what we need is um, you're going to enter it on what I call chat form. I'm going to put the link um, in the chat box for you. And I can resend this information as well across the emails if you registered for this. Um, obviously, you had to have registered for this Zoom meeting. And so what you'll do, I know there's a lot of info on that chat there. So we're going to keep it open until July 22nd. So you have from today until July 22nd at 10 a.m. to do your grilling. So maybe you grill it tomorrow and you're like, oh, I don't like this at all. And then you grill another one the next day. Oh, I don't like this one at all either. And so you have several days to grill up what you want to um, put to perfection for your entree. And it's not due until 10 a.m. And what you'll end up doing is, um, I'm going to go ahead, if, uh, Kirsten, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I'll actually click on this and kind of show them um, how uh, it looks. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen and see what it looks like all right it looks like it must be broken for now i'll fix that link um, and send that out through email uh, it's pretty easy uh, it comes up with a form that um, you'll upload your video and your picture to that and so if you want um, i'll show you the website that um, you can go to and that's on that link as well um, i'll just click on that here really quick and show you that web page just to kind of give you a overall of what it looks like. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. All right, so I'm on, I clicked on that link on there, that second link, and it takes you right to, can, it, can you shake your head if you guys can see this? Everybody can see my page? Yep, perfect, okay. So this is the North Dakota 4-H Grilling um, Contest web page. And it kind of goes through, um, you know, how we do it. Usually we host these in person, but this time we're going to offer it virtual because it allows us to reach all across the world to you guys, which is super exciting. So over on the right, you'll see that I've got some things here. I've got um, the objectives and rules, which you can click on and it'll bring up a PDF. And that PDF will go through and it'll kind of tell you exactly what we're going to be looking for. And so you'll notice in red, it says virtual event here. And so what we're gonna need is for you guys to take a picture of your entree, we need two of them. And you'll see those pictures on the right. So we need one picture of the entire plate. So however you wanna design it, whatever you wanna put on that plate is up to you. Be creative, have fun. And then the second picture is of cutting that particular entree in half. Because we want the judges to see the inside. Um, making sure that, for example, if you cook a hamburger, that it's not bright pink and raw in the middle. And so that's something that we need to make sure. And the second part of that is um, you'll be end up 
putting on a, a, a little video. And so I know it's scary, but I promise you it'll be a lot of fun. And this is a no judgment zone. So have fun doing it. In that video, you're going to explain to us a couple things. So if you scroll to the very bottom um, of this particular thing, um, we've got the in-person um, evaluation. And then you'll see at the top it says overview for the virtual event. And so this is going to give you um, an idea of what the judges are looking for. Remind you, it's free. We want you to have fun doing this. There's absolutely no cost. So these are some things that you're going to want to discuss. So for example, um, this top one, it says preparation and process. So you talk about in your video, um, you know, what are the things that you did to make sure that you did not do cross-contamination? So and this is being recorded, and so you can go back and watch this and remember, well, what did I do to make sure that I didn't put my meat on the same plate or on the same cutting board as my vegetables? So describe to the judge how you made sure that you were a very safe chef grilling that day. Um, and then talk about, you know, what you learned. Um, talk about uh, maybe some of the nutrition content. Maybe there's something that was hard and you wanted to be like, oh, you know, it was a little bit um, hard for me to turn on my grill, but I totally conquered it. You know, we want to hear all of your experience, whatever you want to share within that three minute video, we want to hear it because it's so much fun. It's great public speaking experience. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's something that's just going to be fun for you guys to participate in. And so if I go back, um, you don't have to. Um, submit the recipe entry but I love reading them so if you want to submit it you certainly can um, that recipe entry basically just tells me you get up to three secret ingredients and so for example I had one team that um, last year submitted a raspberry jam and so they had some raspberry puree that they had made and that was one of their secret ingredients so kind of fun to hear this and we want the write-up of what you actually have in your uh, particular uh, uh, entree so we know the judges kind of know and kind of can see what's in that particular picture that you're going to submit so that'll help the judges kind of see and be able to evaluate a little bit better um, we would love for you to take a picture of you grilling have a, a family member take a picture of you grilling and if um, if we can use those that video and the I know some of you have already done a great job and submitted the parental consent form. Um, and so we would love for you guys to um, have your parents fill this out and send it to me via email. And that just allows us to basically brag on you guys and say, hey, these guys were the ones that totally jumped on board and were courageous to come and grill up and do a video for us and send us a picture. And we want to um, put you guys at, you know, potentially at the National 4-H Conference and talk about you guys. So definitely uh, participate in this and have a lot of fun. And I will get you guys the working link because I know I also clicked on that link and it seems like it is not working at this time. So it says whoops. And so I will check on that and make sure that is working by tonight. Um, and that should be good to go. And I'll send out an email to all of you guys to um make sure that you get that updated link are there any questions i'm so glad that you guys are here well i hope all of you guys participate in the um the grill off contest it's free so definitely you know you have nothing to lose all right well i hope you guys learned something tonight um and i hope that it was fun and i know i learned a lot so i i sure appreciate you guys jumping on tonight and joining us and with that i guess if you have no questions i hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your evening and good luck cooking up your chef for a day grill off contest item